Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it. I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and in this video I'm gonna put these three cameras up against each other to help you decide which one might be the right one for you. In this case we have the Nikon Z7 II, the Sony A7R5, and the Canon EOS R5. So I've taken these out into the real world, I've tested them out, so I have a good bunch of real world experience to help you determine which one is the right one. So these three cameras go perfectly against each other because they're priced anywhere from $3,000 to $4,000 and they're the higher megapixel version cameras that aren't the super duper flagships. That's why these three are up on the table. So. Let's start with the specs, starting with the sensors that you find inside of these cameras. The Nikon Z7 II has a 45.7 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor powered by dual Xpeed 6 processors. The Sony a7R5 has a 61 megapixel full frame BSI CMOS sensor that's powered by a Bionz XR processor. And the Canon EOS R5 has a 45 megapixel full frame CMOS sensor that's powered by a Digic X processor, which is the same one that you find in their not flagship, flagship Canon EOS R3. Now let's quickly talk about each of these sensors. The Nikon sensors have always been fantastic, and I'm pretty sure that Sony manufactures their sensors, but Nikon develops and designs their sensors. They basically go, hey Sony, we want this, 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 and in it, in it from their menu, and then Sony Semiconductor, whoever makes their sensors, which is Sony, goes ahead and manufactures that for, the, uh, for Nikon. Now Nikon has always given us great image quality, and the Z7 II produces fantastic results. The 61 megapixel sensor in the Sony, of course, is larger than the other, the, the Canon and the Nikon, and that is a very nice sensor. You get some really nice results out of it as well. And then the R5 here with the Canon, this is a fantastic sensor uh, as well across the board. I mean, I've always been partial to what I got out of Nikon. I love the colors and I love the tones. Maybe I'm just gonna give a check mark to the Z7 this time for the Z7 II. Not that it's gonna get a lot of check marks, so maybe we'll give it a pity check mark right now. Another thing I should mention is that the Sony is gonna give you a 124 megabyte RAW file when you shoot uncompressed RAW. It's a very large file. Nikon's is gonna be smaller than that, and Canon's is gonna be even smaller than that as well. So keep that in mind when you're deciding which one might be the right choice for you. Nonetheless, across the board, you're gonna get fantastic results with these cameras because the sensors are fantastic at this point. Now let's move on to the lens mount. You've got a Z mount, you've got an E mount, and you've got an RF mount. Is one better than the other? Well, that's all, of course a toss up. The Sony E mount for a long time was a great choice because Sony opened up their lens mount to other manufacturers like Tamron as well as Sigma. So there's a lot of Tamron and Sigma lenses, third party lenses that work fantastically well and are less expensive on for the E mount. You also have a ton of great glass from Sony that they like their G Master and their G lenses. Now Nikon has their Z lenses. You can adapt older F mount lenses to this camera. I've found that they don't adapt as seamlessly as EF lenses, so many different acronyms here, but the old autofocusing lenses from Canon adapt really well with the EF to RF adapter. And so I give the leg up just for adaptability when it comes to older lenses. Canon gets a check mark for adaptability because those older EF lenses work perfectly well on here, whereas I feel that the F mount lenses don't work as well adapted to the Z mount. Now, the Z lenses that you have are fairly good. They're also a little bit more expensive. And as of now, they're starting to open it up to, at the time of recording this, one third party manufacturer, and that is Tamron. Tamron is making Z mount lenses. Sigma at this point isn't, so, you know, that's something to keep in mind when you're making a purchase. Now, all the way over here on the Canon front, like I already said, older lenses adapt really well. So if you wanna jump into a system and you have EF glass, that le those lenses are gonna do really well on this body. 
Plus, I really like the options that Canon has made for RF lenses. The 28 to 70 F2 is probably one of my all time favorite lenses I could ever have wanted. I mean, there's some others that I want at this point. There's a 135, 18, you've got a 70 to 200, 2.8, 24 to 70, 2.8, 15 to 35, 2.8, a ton of different options to choose from. And I really love the RF glass. So if I'm gonna give a check mark for my favorite glass at this point, I'm giving it to the Canon side because I love the RF glass. If I'm going to say which is the best choice economically, because there are no third party options at this time, there's no Sigma or Tamron in terms of RF glass, but you could adapt older Sigma and Tamron lenses to this with the EF to RF adapter. I know it's a lot of stuff, but if you're looking to save money and go with some third party native glass for the E-mount, I think Sony is gonna get the check mark when it comes to that. And Nikon, you, you know, you don't get it, you, you know, you don't get a check mark for anything. Now let's move on to the ISO ranges. The Nikon will go from 64 to 25,600 natively, expandable up to 102,400. The Sony goes down to 100 and maxes out at 32,000 natively, but it's expandable also to 102,400. And the Canon starts at 100 ISO up to 51,200 natively, and it's expandable up to 102,400 as well. So as you go to higher ISOs with a higher megapixel camera, you tend not to get the most clean images. Now, I've pushed this to 8,000 ISO, not a problem in a studio situation with good glass. So I haven't had a problem pushing this. If you need to push it well beyond those points, yeah, you might see some noise and grain, but I also never go into the expanded modes. Now, Nikon, on the other hand, goes all the way down to 64 which makes it amazing when it comes to dynamic range and when it comes to shooting landscapes. I love the option of going down to 64 if that's a possibility, and Nikon seems to be the only company that is doing that between these three. And when you push the Nikon a little higher, it's gonna be perfectly fine. The same thing, 8,000, 12,800. You really don't need to go much further than those places if you've got quality glass and you have a little bit of light. And if it's too dark, the picture shouldn't turn out anyway. It's really not the camera's fault at that point. And then, of course, you've got the Canon over here. I've pushed these things pretty far. Uh, yeah, the real world review, we did what? What was that, 16,000 ISO, Stephen? Yeah. Yeah, that was 16,000 ISO, and I was like, damn! And that was with an 11 to 24 F4 adapted onto it, and it looked fantastic. It held up really well. So I think all of these cameras are good. If I was to give a check mark, I'm giving a check mark to the Nikon for the fact that it goes down to 64, but in terms of high ISO capability, in my real world usage, I'm going ahead with the Canon for the best ISO capability when it goes to going higher. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this image taken with the Sony a7R5 and edited with 12, yes, 12 presets from Fro Pack 3. I just wanna show you that it works on almost every one of our presets, starting with Zoolander, that looks cool, Winnebago, then we've got Prestige Worldwide, followed by November Rain, Mount Airy, Mentos, MDMA, King Contrast, Eckert, Capone, Canadian Tuxedo, Almost Famous, and even Fifth Element. But check this out from Fropac One. I wanna show you one click, Skittles. Boom. That's how good Skittles looks in one click on this image. So look, if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow, both on your desktop or on your mobile device, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you wanna pick up the triple play bundle and get Skittles as part of Fropack 1, you get Fropack 1, 2, and 3, and you can save even more. So now, let's get back to the video. Now let's move on to frames per second, AKA the shooting speed. The Nikon can do 10 frames per second in high plus mode. Now you're getting 12 bit lossless compressed raw when you do so. Now in the high mode, you can do nine frames per second, which is 14 bit lossless compressed raw. And being that this is a mirrorless camera, of course you are able to shoot with the electronic shutter and you still get the same frame rates when you shoot with that. Not that this is really designed to be the camera that you 
shoot silently, but if you do need to shoot silent, you do have that capability. Now moving on to the Sony, you can get 10 frames per second. Sony's always claimed the 10 frames per second thing, but of course it comes with a slight caveat because that's 12-bit compressed raw when you shoot in 10 frames a second. Then when you go to their high plus mode, you're only gonna get six frames per second, and that's uncompressed or also lossless compressed raw. So you're only getting six frames a second. Now keep in mind, it's moving a lot of data, but it is extremely slow. Six frames a second in this day and age is really slow. If you're gonna shoot JPEGs, you can get 10 frames per second. Now they also do have some other raw options that will be a small raw at 15 megapixels, medium at 26, and a large, of course, at 61 megapixels. Now when it comes to the electronic shutter in here, it's a head scratcher at four frames a second. I don't even, I don't even, I don't get, I don't get why it can't do the six or the 10 with the electronic shutter, but it just, it, it doesn't. Now, one of the things that Sony added that neither of these two cameras have is the ability to do variable shutter speed. That's where you can put it to one eight hundred and 5.39 of a second. It's just for when you're using, when there's a lot of flickering in the background, but this isn't really a camera that you're gonna use silently unless you absolutely need to get your stills and be silent. And on the Canon front, you get 12 frames per second with the mechanical shutter in high plus mode. Now that's giving you a 13-bit uncompressed RAW file. Now nine frames per second mechanical in high mode is where you get 14-bit uncompressed RAW. And when you shoot with the electronic shutter, you can do 20 frames per second with 12-bit compressed RAW. Yes, 20 frames per second. Not Sony giving you four. How many is that, Steven? Four. Four. And how many you get with the Canon? 20. 20. So who gets a check mark, Steven? Canon. That's right. Canon's getting a check mark for all of the frame rate options here because it's 12 frames per second mechanical and it's 20 frames per second with the electronic. Now let's move on to card slots. The Nikon has one CF Express Type B card and one UHS-2 SD card slot. The Sony has two CF Express Type A card slots, which is also reverse compatible with SD cards, which means you can put SD cards in this camera or you can put in CF Express Type A cards. Now the Canon has one CF Express Type B and one UHS-2 SD card slot. I used to think I didn't really like that that much, but honestly it hasn't been that bad for me when I'm shooting with the EOS R3 and it has one CF Express Type B and one SD card just like this has. Would I prefer redundancy two of the same card slots? The answer to that is yes, because I want matching cards. Canon doesn't do that. Nikon doesn't do that. Sony does that, but you'd think I'd give them a check mark for doing that, but I won't. Why won't I? Because those cards, those CF Express Type A cards, are astronomically expensive. At the time of recording this, they're really freaking expensive. They're fast, but they're not as fast as the other card slots that are the CF Express Type Bs. Those are faster and much less expensive. So who's getting a check mark, Steven? No one. Don't even answer. No one's getting a check mark. One other thing that I do need to add about the card slots is I'm a big fan of redundancy. So I like having two cards in the camera and they're saving raw files to both cards. Now, all of these cameras give you that ability to save raw to both cards. Now, only two of them give you the ability to write video to both cards and Nikon isn't one of them. So you can guess which are the two that can do that. Moving on to autofocus, which is one of my biggest things to talk about. The Nikon, yeah, let me just tell you about it. 493 phase detect AF points, there's IAF and there's subject tracking. The Sony has 693 phase detect AF points. You've got IAF, you've got lock on tracking. You've got something that is called an AI powered chip, which includes some deep learning to track humans, animals, birds, insects, vehicles, airplanes, trains, automobiles, because you know, that movie, Throw Mama from the Train. No, that movie was Trains, Planes, and Automobiles. Was that Throw Mama from the Train or a different movie? I think it was a different movie altogether, as well as focus mapping when it comes to video. Canon has 1,053 phase detect autofocusing points with something called dual pixel AF. It has IAF, it has subject tracking for humans, animals, birds, vehicles. It also has a focus guide, which is pretty cool when you're shooting manual, that lines up these triangles and when it is green, it means go, it means that you're in focus. Now, do all of those focusing numbers mean anything? The 1,000 and the 400 and the, the 600 and whatevers? 
I mean, in some way they do, but it's not the same as when we had 11 focusing points back in the day, and then we went to 16 or whatever, and we could independently select them. At this point, this is the most important technology in mirrorless cameras, and that's the autofocusing system and the ability to track subjects and find the eyes and find the airplanes. I mean, airplanes aren't hard to find. Anything, can, a Pentax can find an airplane and track it. It's not that hard. It's big, it's flying in the sky, and it really doesn't matter where it focuses as long as it's on the freaking airplane. I'm gonna go down the list here. The Nikon autofocus is um, really good for landscapes. Yeah, things that aren't moving. It can autofocus with subjects that are moving. It can shoot sports. It just doesn't do it very well. The only Nikon currently on the market that does well is the Z9. That is the only Nikon mirrorless camera that I can give a stamp of approval to and say it's good-ish and, and does what it needs to do. Doesn't do it perfectly, but it does it a hell of a lot better than the Z7. This is not the camera you look to if you're looking for autofocus. The Canon on the other side, we're gonna go all the way over here to the Canon. The Canon has dual pixel AF. It has deep learning, it's fantastic. The autofocusing system in the Canon is very similar, if not, it's the same as what you find in the Canon R3, which is a $6,000 plus dollar camera. Now this doesn't have a stack sensor like that, but it uses the same processor. It uses the same autofocus, and it is incredible whether you're shooting action or whether you're shooting landscapes which is of course easy or IAF to find portraits or if you're shooting wide open with their RF lenses at 1.2 using the 50 or using the 85 you are going to nail focus time and time again where you wouldn't be able to do that in the past with a DSLR and it's also a little more difficult with IAF when it comes to the, uh, the Nikon. Now, Sony, I went to them last because they just came out with this new AI processor that has deep learning in it, which makes it very similar to the dual pixel AF, where it finds bodies, it locks onto the heads, it finds the back of the head, it tracks the subjects. It does a much better job, and it's much closer to what Canon has had out for a couple of years. These would be my choices when it comes to autofocus. Now, the check mark is going to Canon, clearly. The Canon autofocus, the dual pixel AF, is the best across the board. And after using every new camera for the last five, six years, and especially when it comes to mirrorless, Canon's getting the check mark. If you're looking to shoot action, this is an extremely well-rounded camera. If you're looking to do portraits, you could do it with all of them. But when it comes to autofocus, Canon is absolutely getting the check mark. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio, use what I've been using for more than 10 years, 10 years for my personal website at jaredpolin.com because it's simple, easy, affordable, and I don't need to know coding. In a matter of five minutes, you can have galleries up and be ready to go out into the world. So if you wanna get a 14 day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo. If you decide that it's for you, use the code photo at checkout to get 10% off your first order. Now that we got that out of the way, let's move on to the video feature, starting with the Nikon. You can do 4K up to 60 frames per second with pixel binning with a 1.08 crop. You could shoot Super 35 cropped 4K up to 30 frames per second, which is oversampled from 5K with no pixel binning. You could do 1080p at 120 frames per second. And all video modes are available in 8-bit 420 color. You can do 4K 12-bit raw video output to an external recorder. Order. Now onto the Sony, you can shoot UHD 8K video recordings up to 24 frames per second with a 1.2x crop factor with no pixel binning. Now full frame 4K, you can do up to 60 frames per second with a 1.2x crop with pixel binning. Now Super 35, which is gonna give you the best quality that you can get out of this camera, is giving you cropped 4K up to 30 frames per second that's oversampled from 6.2K with no pixel binning. You can do 1080p up to 120 frames per second, and most of the video modes are available with 10-bit 422 color, except for 8K, which is 420, and you can do 4K 16-bit video recording outputted to an external recorder. And finally, the Canon R5 gives you full-frame DCI 8K video recording recording up to 30 frames per second with no pixel binning. You can do full frame 4K up to 120 frames per second with binning. 4K HQ mode is oversampled from 8.1K with no pixel binning up to 30 frames per second. And all video modes available in 10-bit 422 color. 
you can do 8K 12-bit raw video output. And I should tell you that we are recording with the Canon EOS R5 right now. Those are the cameras of choices that we use here in the studio when it comes to recording our videos. We shoot it in the 4K oversampled, and sometimes we also shoot some 8K when we want to punch in just a little bit. So as you can see, all of these cameras are capable of shooting video. Some of them are better than others. The Z7 is really not the video-centric camera. This isn't the one that you buy if you want to shoot video on the Nikon front. The Sony does a very good job, but again, the 61 megapixel sensor, it's really meant to be a stills type camera first and foremost, but you do have nice options when it comes to video as well as with the autofocus. And then the Canon, is obviously fantastic because it's what we chose to use here at the factory. We love the glass and we love the quality that we're able to pull out of these cameras. Now, if you've looked up the R5 in the past and you've heard things about overheating, that was a thing back when it came out almost two years ago. At this point, with all the firmware upgrades, we don't even have any issues when it comes to overheating. The camera just rolls. Oh, speaking of rolling, you do have a time limit when it comes to recording your video. It's 29 minutes and 59 seconds. The same thing is in the Nikon and the Sony on the other side got rid of the recording limits altogether for most of the modes. And one of the other differentiators here is that the Sony offers you a digital hot shoe where the other two cameras don't. The Big Brother or the video centric version of the 5, the R5C, does offer you the digital hot shoe. So, which one is going to get the check mark for video? Well, I mean, we kind of have to go with the one that we personally use here in the studio. We go with the R5. Moving on to image stabilization, all these cameras now have IBIS. Now, that's going to help you stabilize when subjects are not moving and it's going to counterbalance any of your movement. Or if you're on a boat, I'm on a boat. I'm on a boat. If you're on a boat, then you can switch into a certain mode and it's gonna help stabilize that as well. So you've got five axis stabilization in the Z7 II. It gives you up to five stops of compensation with certain lenses. The Sony gives you five axis in-body stabilization up to eight stops of compensation with the IBIS mechanism alone. So you're getting eight stops of stabilization, which is absolutely fantastic. And it doesn't need to be paired with certain lenses with IS. You're getting that no matter what. Now, Canon also has the five axis in body stabilization up to eight stops of compensation only with certain of the new RF lenses that have IS built in. It's what's called a dual IBIS system. And we've been able to handhold this thing really low. It's nice that Sony gives you the ability to do it for eight stops with just about every lens and not just the lenses with the stabilization built in. So these are the options that you would go for. Nikon's is fine. But as you can tell that the, the Nikon at this point is well outdated in comparison to these. Again, if you want to be that landscape shooter with Nikon, I mean, I love the image quality off of this camera. So keep that in mind when you're making that decision. If you're someone who already owns Nikon, I mean, I should probably save this for the end of the video, but if you're someone who already owns Nikon, oh no, I'm gonna save this till the end of the video. Next up, we've got electronic viewfinders. We've got a 3.69 million dot EVF that has a 60 frames per second refresh rate in the Nikon. The Sony has a 9.44 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. And the Canon has 5.76 million dot EVF with 120 frames per second refresh rate. The electronic viewfinders in all of these cameras are really good. I've had no issues using the R5. The viewfinder here on the Sony is extremely good. Does more megapixels in the viewfinder, like 9 million pixels, the 9 million versus the, the 5 million, do you notice the difference? And the answer is like, not really. I, 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 at some point, you kind of have diminishing returns and you don't really notice much of a difference. But the Sony is good, the Nikon's nice and colorful, and the Canon's very good as well. Electronic viewfinders are fantastic. Since we just talked about EVFs, let's talk about the LCD screens on the back of this camera. And here's a public service address announcement for everybody out there. Do not use the LCD screen as your primary source of shooting pictures. Do not be the person that holds it out like this and is like, oh, look at me. I have like a really expensive camera and I'm just gonna use the LCD screen. Yeah, am I gonna get yelled out in the comments for saying that? Yeah, but the proper way to take pictures is lock your elbows in, put your eye up to that electronic viewfinder and start shooting pictures. In situations where you can't see something or you need to go high or you need to go really low, you use the flip out screens if they have a flip out screen. In that case, by all means, don't look through the viewfinder because you can't see through the viewfinder. Now that that's out of the way, we have a 3.2 inch, 2.1 million dot tilting touchscreen on the Nikon. We've got a 3.2 inch 
2.36 million dot four axis multi-angle touchscreen here on this camera and it flips out and rotates and on the Canon we have a 3.2 inch 2.1 million dot vary angle touchscreen. If I'm giving a check mark here I'm absolutely giving it to the Sony for their new design that they've done this. I like that you can have the screen on the back of the camera and be able to flip it down like this because it stays lined up with the back of the camera. Also when you flip out the screen it's more even and parallel to the line that the camera has on the back. Whereas with the Canon, it's like tilted the wrong way. You can never get your line straight. It's much more difficult. And the Nikon, well, it, it, it can't flip out at all because I flip out sometimes. It's been a while, but it doesn't flip out at all. So the Sony is absolutely getting four check marks for four axes and flippy out rotatable screens because this gives you the best of both worlds. Are you into podcasts? Well, if so, we have one called Frono's Photo Raw Talk that comes out every Friday. So if you're looking for new episodes or something to listen to, head on over to fronosphoto.com slash podcast to check out the past episodes now or download wherever you listen to your podcasts. Now, let's get back to the video. Battery power, which one of these cameras will last longer? Like the Energizer Bunny, I don't know because it's not very easy to test that in real world situations. You have the ENEL15C battery with the Nikon. You do have USB-C charging while you're using it. You can get a grip and you can actually hot swap batteries when you're shooting video. Of course, you could shoot it to swap it when you're doing video as well. The Sony uses an NP-FZ100 battery, AKA their Z battery. You do get USB-C charging while using the camera and you can get a grip as well to put two batteries in and get the vertical shooting capability. The Canon has the LPE6NH battery with USB-C charging. Now you do need to use that specific battery when it comes to getting the most frame rates per second, the most frames per second when you're shooting stills. So keep that in mind when you're buying your batteries. You want to get the latest ones that go for this specific camera. You can also put a grip on this so you can put two batteries in the grip as well. No one's getting a check mark here because no one really knows. But as always, get extra batteries. And if you're a photographer who's out there in the real world and you're shooting and you're running and gunning and you shoot vertical from times and you want more battery power, consider purchasing a grip. The grip kind of makes you, one, it makes you look better, more professional, and it gives you the ability to go vertical if you need to. Now let's talk about the weight real quick. The Nikon weighs in at 1.4 pounds or 615 grams. The Sony's 1.46 pounds or 665 grams. And then the Canon is a chunker at 1.62 pounds or 738 grams. And by chunker, I mean, it's not really that much heavier than these cameras. But being that we're talking about weight, how do these bad boys feel in the hands? I think the Nikon has always been designed fantastically well, feels really good in the hands, but there aren't as many mappable buttons. The buttons seem to be in weird places compared to the Sony and the Canon. The Canon's got a ton of mappable buttons, feels fantastic in the hands. The, when you put the grip on there, it feels really good as well. So the feel of this body is very nice. And the feel of the Sony, Sony's done a great job of making their bodies start to feel better. In the past, they didn't feel very good. Still has more of that rubbery or the plastic feel when you touch the rubber. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But a ton of mappable, customizable buttons is always great. Sony does a great job with that. Uh, Nikon's not getting a check mark. Uh, Dan, Dan, when you're editing this, take away a check mark from Nikon, please. They lose a check mark for the not great amount of buttons that aren't where they need to be. Now onto the very important thing of the price. The Nikon Z7 II comes in at 2,800 bucks at the time of this recording because it's actually currently on sale, saving 200 bucks. The Sony comes in just shy of $4,000 and we're just shy of $4,000 with the R5 as well. Now keep in mind, when Nikon came out with their Z7, the original one, it was priced around $3,400. So these are all pretty comparably priced across the board. Um, no one's getting a check mark for price at this point. Do I wish they were a little lower than 3,800 or 3,900 or 4,000 bucks? The answer is yeah, I wish they were, but in the current environment that we're in, I think these are the prices and this is where they're going to stay. So there really isn't a benefit with saving a couple hundred dollars and going with the Nikon. All right, it, it's time to wrap this up and give you my thoughts on what direction you should go. Remember earlier when I said, I'm gonna tell you later about the Nikon? and what I think you should do with it. Even if you're a Nikon shooter and you have a bunch of old F-mount glass, unless you are just 
going and doing landscapes or you're just someone who just wants to take pictures and I'm not talking professionally, I'm talking just going out into the world and you just enjoy your hikes and you enjoy your shooting, then the Nikon's fine. Then you can take the lenses that you have and adapt it or maybe buy some of the new ones and be okay with it. But if I was starting fresh today, unfortunately I can't recommend going with the Nikon today. Unless it was a Z9, that's a different story. We, we would get into that in another video. We have a comparison between the Z9, the A1, and the, uh, the R3. You can watch that video. But I hate to say it that I, I can't recommend going this direction with these other two cameras sitting here. The Nikon is just buried by the features and functions that you get for photos and stills and customizability and shooting speeds and everything else that you get out of these cameras right here. So even though I grew up as a Nikon shooter for 20 plus years, I can't recommend that you go this direction. The direction is more in the Sony and Canon world right now. If you want 61 megapixels, you want those more megapixels for portraits, for landscape, then clearly, the choice would be Sony for you. If you like the fact that the E-mount has a lot of options for third-party lenses right now for Sigmas and for Tamrons and you can get Sony lenses, then this is a great choice. This is gonna be very good for, for video. It's gonna be very good for stills. But I think the most versatile, and by think, I know the most, most versatile one is the R5. It's what we've been using for a long time, not just for stills, but also videos in the studio. It's so well-rounded. It's gotten a lot of great firmware upgrades. They've gotten rid of, or they've taken care of that overheating problem that should have never been a problem at the forefront and was a major headache for Canon because it was an issue. Now it's no longer an issue. This camera holds up today. Even though the Sony is newer, this camera's autofocus capability is fantastic. If you're a sports shooter and you don't want to spend $6,500 and get something like an R3, this is great. I know professional shooters that shoot hockey for Getty images that use this over the R3 because they love the 45 megapixels for cropping. Not my cup of tea, but they like to crop and that's why they stick with this. RF glass is fantastic. Adapting older EF glass is even more fantastic. The issue, you, there's no third party support right now. So no Sigma and no Tamron. If you wanna save money in that situation, then the Sony's gonna be a good choice. But when you're spending just shy of $4,000 plus more when it comes to batteries and getting a grip, then I don't think the money is as big of a deal as possible, because if it is, you're gonna go with a Z6 II, you're gonna go with what's below this, the A7 IV, or an R6 or an R6 II. That's what you're gonna end up looking at. So that's my thoughts, that's my opinions on this camera, on these three cameras going head to head. What do you think? Let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching. Jared, PolandFronosPhoto.com. See ya.